Welcome to the A16Z podcast. I'm Michael Copeland, and uh, we have a really interesting lineup of, of folks here today. Um, I'll start with one of our visitors who's come from the farthest away, I think, David Madden, um, who's Internews Strategy and Advisor in Myanmar. David, welcome. Oh, thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. And uh, joining us also is A. Mo, who's a, a co-founder of Baden, um, which is a startup here in uh, Silicon Valley and Mountain View. But you are also originally from Myanmar and an engineer and uh, a technologist. So, um, And on the line is Ethan Zuckerman, director of the Center for Civic Media at the MIT Media Lab. Ethan, welcome. Thanks for having me. So as you can tell, this, this, this uh, conversation is sort of focused in Southeast Asia and on technology and other parts of the world. And, you know, internews, maybe, David, let's start with you. You guys have some, some news that you guys broke. Tell us a little bit about that and give us some context for what you're doing in Myanmar. Yeah. Well, thanks again for having us, Michael. It's, it's great to be here today. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So um, <clears throat> for those of you who, who don't know about internews, internews is, a, is an international NGO. It's been going for a bit over 30 years, um, works in about 90 different countries around the world. Um, and its mission really is to empower people through better access to information. Um, and so Internews has been working in Myanmar for about 12 years now. Um, and um, a lot of the work that it, it has done in the early part of its time in Myanmar has been focused on um, you know, what you might refer to as traditional media. But there is this incredibly interesting thing happening in Myanmar right now, which is um, a connectivity revolution. It's liberalised its telecommunications market, and now suddenly there are four well-funded telcos racing to put a smartphone in the hands of Myanmar's 51.4 million people. So this is creating this really interesting opportunity to use um, to use technology in interesting ways. So. We um, have uh, just launched the Myanmar Innovation Greenhouse. This is a, a physical space um, that's going to bring uh, technology together with civil society uh, and independent media to build the kind of technology tools and platforms that are going to accelerate change and development um, in Myanmar. So it's really exciting. Um, Mo, you come from Myanmar, so give us a bit of a background. As David mentioned, you know, this is a country that was closed off for a long time and has opened up recently, both in terms of its borders, but then, you know, both physically and now digitally. Um, what has the change meant to you? And as you've seen it happen, you know, where are we today and, and where were we, you know, 10 years ago? Uh, probably 10 years ago, a lot of, you know, Information has been restricted, censored, everything that you publish, everything that you record, any kinds of distributed information is something that the government approved of, right? So there's this weird gap in the feelings of people where they're allowed to talk about and write about things that may be not quite in line with government's you know, official messages. And that's been really strange to see, especially people in our generation that grew up with, you know, no access to outside of the world and no access to uh, written media that may be slightly critical of the government ever. And then, boom, everything opens up and you're seeing journalists, bloggers, independent media that's going out and talking about things and looking into things and something that's never happened before, right? So, if you imagine 10 years ago, I always compare it to uh, 1984, George Orwell's book, is very close to truth. That's what I grew up with. People have a little bit of a fear of, you know, saying anything slightly wrong. So right. then it goes from there to now you can talk about a lot of things. And the funny thing is when you grew up with, like, everything is controlled by a state media and the Burmese have a very big gap between a formal language, like what's written, and what you speak. So if you study Burmese, you'll find this like slightly disconcerting way of expressing their ideas when they are writing versus when they are talking. And now there's a lot of informal medias and things and like interviews and people are talking about ideas and I'm actually kind of like, I don't actually know how to write this 
kind of blogging freedom of information and like a lot of, you know, things that people usually say, you kind of use some sort of euphemism or things that are, that will go slightly under the radar for the government censor. Now mm -hmm. you can say explicitly, hey, this is what I think, or hey, this is what's wrong with the country or what's wrong with the system. I think there is actually like adjustment period for every, every one of us to get to, hey, you don't have to write so formally. You don't have to be so strict about how you communicate. So I think that's fascinating. I mean, what's fascinating too, boom sounds like the right word where, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, you go from a very sort of closed society and technology was very closely held. And I just want to know, and David, please chime in, you know, um, and Ethan, you as well. When that that kind of unveiling happens, how does technology manifest itself, and how do people adjust? It must be, you know, we have this sort of incremental iOS six to iOS seven to iOS eight, and all of a sudden you go from zero to five thousand. What happens? Well, we're 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 discovering it like literally right now. So until um, about eight weeks ago, there was only the government-owned state telco. That was the only provider. Um, uh, and just in the last eight weeks, you've had these two new international telcos launch um, in Myanmar, and one more is coming. And suddenly now, a SIM card doesn't cost you $250, which is what it cost when I landed in Myanmar. Um, now you can get one for $1.50. And so you have lines around the block, um, like you would for the iPhone 6, but it's, people are lining up to get a SIM card. Um, and it's, it's, an incredible, it's an incredible thing to see because people are... These are not people who've had landlines. I mean, people basically had no phones um, in Myanmar, uh, and now, now they do. Um, and so how does this manifest itself? What does it look like? Well, um, it's interesting because um, for many people who are connected in Myanmar, it's still a small percentage of the population, but Facebook is the internet. Right. Um, it's, almost like, it's almost like AOL in the late 90s here in the States, uh, whereas you've got this kind of wall garden and everything sort of takes place on Facebook. Oh, oh what do you like about the internet? Uh, I just, I use Facebook. Right. You know? um, but it's, it's really interesting because, um, you know, Viber um, is just setting up a, a, a country rep, actually, in, in Myanmar, and they just visited last month. And Viber is a carrier, is a... A, a Viber, the 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 um, the over the top uh, service, um, okay, that, that competes with WhatsApp and Line, yes, and, okay. and, um, and with Skype, and with and with Skype, yeah, okay. and um, and so Facebook has, um, I mean, Facebook has about two point two uh, million um, people online in in Myanmar. Facebook users, yeah. um, but Viber announced just um, just in August that they had five million users. Um, and what's the difference? Well, you don't need an email address to sign up for Viber. All you need is your all you need is your SIM card. Um, mm. So people don't have an email address to sign up for Facebook. It's actually easier to sign up for a service like Viber, um, and it works so well for transferring files and making calls and things. So there's all these really interesting things that we're going to see as sort of 51.4 million people suddenly come online. Ethan, you know. Have you seen this in other parts of the world, and and what might and well, what might be we start to see in in Myanmar, and and what might be different? Well, it's interesting. Myanmar, to a certain extent, is unprecedented, which is to say, it's hard to think of a society that was as closed as Myanmar, <clears throat> opening to technology as much and as quickly. Um, we've had countries that have been as closed, but they've opened up much more slowly. So, for instance, we've watched Cuba have the rise of the mobile Internet and the rise of the blogosphere and uh, a really interesting political culture, but they've opened up very, very slowly. We've seen um, various other developing nations build, but they haven't built an online sphere sort of coming out of a, a, a space of heavy censorship and then suddenly into openness. So this idea of sort of starting from scratch and opening up very, very quickly, this is quite new in the digital age. Um, I do think one interesting thing we can look at is how independent media has already opened up in Myanmar. Um, 
So Myanmar for many, many years was the place where all the press was state-controlled, and what it meant was if you had an independent publication, you had to have it reviewed by the government before it went out. And that was incredibly time-consuming, and it meant that no one could publish anything more than a weekly. Um, those uh, regulations changed uh, a little bit more than two years ago, and we suddenly had an explosion of daily newspapers, uh, at least seven dailies going out, where you once had none. Uh, and you suddenly got uh, many, many dozens of weekly publications coming out. So I think one of the first things to think about is that there's enormous pent-up demand people who wanted access to different forms of information and are very quickly sort of moving in to take advantage of the market. Um, as David said, though, the, the Myanmar Internet market is, is pretty unique and pretty unusual. Uh, and the ways in which Facebook um, has a, a first-mover advantage are quite interesting. If you think about this idea of if you join the Internet today, there's a good chance that Facebook would, want to be, would be one of the very major things you would do. Right. And I found experiences that sort of going around and talking to journalists in Myanmar, they don't talk in terms of page views, they don't talk in terms of readers, they talk in terms of likes. And on the one hand, it's great that Facebook has been a quick way online for them. On the other hand, it is a closed environment. And so for independent media, it's tricky because it's hard to make money off of. We're also interested to see what is it going to mean as far as people starting up new tech businesses. Are they going to start them around the web environment that the rest of us are used to, or are they going to start it up more around some of those closed environments? Yeah, I mean, you don't see, again, it's early days, and, and Mo, jump in here. You don't see it sort of as a mobile focused kind of app based push is it still kind of the web and the desktop or what's what's is it leaped over that immediately i think it just kind of skipped over there would be a lot of burmese people who have never had a desktop or a laptop but only know what internet is through mobile like for them internet means something on your phone that you can access to information outside of what you can get so Mo, tell us a little bit about how you know you came to mountain view you're an engineer how did you end up here? Uh, so I started learning to code when I was about 13 back in Burma. And it was like an after-school program that the school just had. And I was like, of course I want to learn. It was just fun. And I learned how to code in BASIC on a 386. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Yeah. Right. Um, then I was waiting to go to college. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1998, and there was an event in 1988 that basically led to complete anarchy and that shut down the universities. So when you graduate from, like around the time when I was graduating from high school, you have to wait about two to three years before you could go to college. So there's a sort of mandatory gap years for everybody. So I look around and decided I'm going to study more programming and computer science on my own so I did took a lot of like private classes and just hang out with a bunch of friends who are into the same thing mm -hmm. then interestingly it was actually a journalist who came to United States to Harvard MPH and he found out that even if you are a foreign student you could get a financial aid or a scholarship to go to universities here because I never thought about going out of the country to study because there's no way my parents could afford the tuition that, right. you know. So um, he, he found out that, hey, you, you could be a foreign student, you could get financial aid. He came back to, the, to, the, uh, to Burma and he started holding these private letter seminars and telling kids like us, hey, if you want to study outside of the country, you could actually apply for financial aid, and there are a neat uh, blind admission process. So I apply maybe within, like from the day he told me to the day I got the admission letter from MIT, it was probably a total of four months or so. So you went to <laughs> MIT for, for college? I did, and I did computer science. Um, then, mostly for visa reasons and stuff, I started working at big tech companies, uh, kept going from really big companies do smaller and smaller until I started my own. 
So we started the company in Boston uh, with two other co-founders, then moved west like so many other startups. Um, so we've been here about four years now, and it's been great. So what was coding um, as a woman, as a young woman in, in Myanmar, was that unusual? Were you one of, you know, no, very few? No, it was not. It was not. The, the first class that I actually took when I was 13 was mostly women. And that's one thing that is very interesting to me is, again, Burma has been closer for so long, and historically is a matriarchal society. So we haven't had a chance to get influenced by a lot of Disney princess phenomena, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it seems pretty normal to us to see professors, surgeons, um, a lot of pe- things are being run by women, and that seems normal. We never right. actually had, like, kind of the talk that we see here where women don't really go into engineering or science stuff. Also, in, like, you know, Burmese legends and stuff, the princesses are the ones who teach at university. So that's a kind of like interesting uh, contrast for somebody who grew up that way with a very close society and then went straight to the kind of the high-tech environment here. And as a starter founder, it seems very interesting to hear all kinds of, you know, women in tech issue. Well, the, the princesses who teach and who start companies, that's a Disney movie I would like to see. Sure. <laughs> um, so, David, the Innovation Greenhouse... W- What are you setting up there? Who comes, or who will come, I should say? Um, Maybe it's open doors already, but explain to us what you guys are building and then how you hope it sort of gets out there in the world in Myanmar. Yeah. Well, as I'm sure Ethan um, will be able to talk about in more detail, we've seen around the world how powerful these spaces, these ICT hubs can be um, for harnessing technology. And during the course of this year, um, through our initiative Code for Change Myanmar, we've run the country's first ever hackathons. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we've really seen firsthand just how much potential there is to use technology for, for social change and for development. Can I just ask about those yeah. hackathons? Did, yeah. did you have a problem that you presented to folks? Did you have a theme? Or is it just sort of like, okay, guys, let's go? Yeah, no, absolutely. We, so the first hackathon, which we were told by, <laughs> told by everyone was the first ever hackathon in Myanmar, so we called it Myanmar's first ever hackathon. Um, we actually went out to the NGO community, to the civil society community, um, and we told them we were going to hold this event, and we asked them to submit the challenges and the problems Mm -hmm. for the event. And so we had everything from how would you use new technology to reach um, hard to reach sex workers through to how might you use technology to um, inform farmers about the outbreak of pests or diseases. Um, And so we had eight problems submitted by NGOs uh, and we gathered together 76 uh, designers and, and developers to work on these. And I think we really saw it at that, at that hackathon in March. Wow. You know, for any naysayer out there, like, it's clear that there is real potential here for doing this kind of work in Myanmar. And so that really is the genesis of the, of the Innovation Greenhouse. And I think the idea behind the Innovation Greenhouse is that we're going to actually create a space that's going to be a permanent physical home for this kind of collaboration between different parts of Myanmar society that are critical to its change and development. So talking specifically about the technology community coming together with civil society and with independent media to create the kind of products that we know can increase the impact that these change agents are engaged in. Ethan, you know, can you tell us what what, what evidence there is that these hubs, these kinds of kind of focused locations work? Um, where else are we seeing it, and what happens? Sure. Well, there, there's a, a pretty terrific success story in Nairobi uh, around an incubator called the iHub. Um, and the iHub um, was put together sort of as the home office and then sort of public events space um, for a company called Ushahidi, uh, which is a, a Kenyan open source software company that I, I chair the board of. And, and the folks in Ushahidi quickly figured out that they wanted to be able to convene 
uh, as many of the folks working on technology in Kenya as possible, create sort of a focal point for people who wanted to work on technology in Kenya, create a place where people could come together into a physical space and share ideas and sort of find the ability to make teams. Um, and that project has now spun out um, over 50 startups. Um, it's become the hub of not just sort of desktop development, but server-side software development, mobile phone development, and a lot of other types of tech hacking uh, within not just Kenya, but really sort of East Africa as a whole. Uh, and in fact, that whole neighborhood of Nairobi has sort of now turned into the cool place to run a startup. So it turns out that when you are just starting out um, the technical economy uh, in a country, um, it's great to have a cool, open space that brings in people from the outside. It's really useful for people visiting from outside the country to have a place where they can go meet people involved in the startup space. Um, so all of that said, it doesn't work everywhere. Uh, yeah. And the folks behind iHub have been asked to go out and sort of expand the idea across the African continent. Um, and they've done it mostly in partnership. And in some countries, it's gone very, very well. In some countries, it's had a harder time. It turns out that what you really need is a strong pre-existing tech community that was looking for a seed crystal. And I think Myanmar does have that as, as evidenced by how much turnout there has been for the hackathon. There's clearly a lot of pent up need. I think the second piece that is essential, and this is going to be really interesting, um, you know, for uh, the Innovation Greenhouse, is that these things do need to be locally owned and run eventually. And I think, uh, as I understand it, the plan around the Greenhouse is to start it with international support, is to start it with coaching from, from groups like Engineers and some of the other funders behind it, um, but really quickly get to the point where this is a project coming out of Myanmar, really run by people in Myanmar, and I, I think that's probably the best path towards success. What role does, does government play then in, in kind of pursuing this or, or, or I guess, advancing this in Myanmar? Well, that's a really interesting question, Michael. I mean, I think that, <clears throat> um, you know, the sort of activity that we're seeing now in Myanmar frankly wouldn't have been possible without the kind of policy reforms that this uh, quasi-civilian um, government has undertaken. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they conducted this um, process to issue these new telco licenses and and they, they did it they did it pretty thoroughly and pretty professionally. And um, and as a result of that, you you now have a much, much more competitive um, telecommunications market, which is really um, enabling there to actually be a market for these new tech startups and others to, to go after. Um, so that's pretty fundamental. Like, the, <laughs> there wouldn't have been any of this with, without that. Um, you know, as, as Mo said, there's been um, pretty dramatic changes in the kind of censorship laws and the restrictions that there's been on the media in the past. Um, now, that's not to say all, all is rosy <laughs> and, right. it's, and it's a done deal. And I want to be really clear about that. Um, there are really serious challenges ahead. Um, independent media, for example, now needs to figure out how do we, su how do we survive? <laughs> how do we make money? How do we get our product distributed around this country? It's a big country, geographically a big country um, with pretty poor infrastructure. Um, and their product is critical to the future of the country. But how do they get it out there? How do they, how do they take advantage of this connectivity revolution without it further undercutting their business model? So, um, so I think you know, some of these changes that the government have made in these last couple of years are just absolutely critical to creating this opportunity. Um, and there is a very important like, regulatory framework here uh, that, that has to operate in. I mean, the next critical piece here is, is going to be about payments and mobile money and things. And, you know, the decisions that the government makes in the next few months about the regulatory environment for mobile payments and money, absolutely critical to whether or not we're going to have a flourishing um, tech ecosystem or not. I mean, it's going to be a long way and there's a lot of work to be done. Just rule of law and business contracts and things that are 
you know, taken for granted in everywhere else in the world, we still have to figure those out, right? Like, I think the two things, the distribution, for, as speaking as a starter founder, distribution and marketplaces are going to be so essential. But at the same time, how meaning, do you... Meaning it has to go beyond the sort of boundaries of, of Myanmar or... Uh, both, just even within Myanmar, right? Like if you build an app for a firmer and the firmer doesn't really get to a bigger city, maybe more, not more than once a year. So how do you get all these information out there without a marketplace like Google Play Store. I don't know if you can actually list a Burmese app it's, as a Burmese developer. It's open developer. now. It is oh, open, yeah. Oh, that must be very new. It, 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 it came just, um, I think, like the day before Eric Schmidt arrived in the country last year. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and like, uh, you know, Apple Coincidence, Store. Coincidence, I wonder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Apple, the iTunes Store still don't have, um, you can't actually do, you know, business as a developer with a Burmese address. So... I'm hearing all kinds of scheme to like actually have Remy's developer listing their apps in Play Store and iTunes Store with a, a friend from outside of the country listing on behalf of them. Interesting. So I wonder, and, and Ethan, I want to hear your, your your perspective on this. But like, you know, we talked about how for for everyone in Myanmar, the internet is the mobile internet. You know, journalism flourishes by sharing and by likes. It's it's a world that in some ways we're headed toward here. But we haven't even reached that yet. Are there things that we can learn, you know, as this greenhouse, as this experiment, and, and as it gathers momentum, are there things that we can learn here in the United States and in other parts of the world from, from folks like, you know, you all? I, well, I, absolutely. I do think um, there's a long history of technology in the developing world leapfrogging uh, technology elsewhere. And so, you know, for those of us who've been following this for a while, Africa was a great introduction to what a mobile phone-only world would look like um, because we had so many countries in which there were no landlines and we could watch what happened when everyone sort of simultaneously moved to mobile. And it, it was a, a very interesting shift. Um, Myanmar is now going to have this experience of never really having dealt with the desktop Internet. Uh, and so there are going to be these interesting questions. The app model, where people are paying modest amounts of money, maybe that uh, captures the market uh, rather than an ad-supported Internet market. Uh, the ad market is still uh, pretty early, pretty young in Myanmar. Uh, maybe, particularly if payment systems catch on really quickly, maybe we simply end up with an entirely different revenue model. It's going to be really interesting to think about um, how people are building and programming. It's not going to be um, people uh, building on desktops for desktops. It may be a small group of people uh, building software and building content for that mobile market. One of the things I'm really interested in is sort of making sure that phenomena like citizen journalism uh, and citizen media catch on in Myanmar because the media environment is still really complicated. There's not pre-press censorship in the way there was before, but the government is clearly watching the press very, very closely, yeah. uh, and it is far from a completely open press. So in some cases, it may be watching things that evolve more quickly in Myanmar because there is no legacy to build on top of. And in some cases, it may be sort of consciously looking in and saying, how can we make sure that we end up with the Internet uh, as a digital public sphere and sort of ensuring that it's a space where um, Myanmar can really sort of work out public issues going forward? If I could just add to that, Michael, um, I think one of the things that makes what is happening in Myanmar right now interesting to folks in more developed markets here in the Bay Area and elsewhere is um, that it is – Myanmar is – not just sort of mobile only, but very specifically, it's going straight to smartphones. Right. Like the difference between when um, uh, Africa experiences connectivity revolution and, and, and now when Myanmar has experienced its connectivity revolution is that the cost of an Android-based smartphone has fallen so much. It's now cheaper 
uh, to get an Android-based smartphone, you know, made in China or, or elsewhere, um, than it was to buy a candy bar phone in Africa back when they were when they were coming online. And so, basically, Myanmar is going more or less straight, not just to mobile, but straight to smartphone. And you're going to have 51.4 million people experiencing internet and engaging with the internet for the first time through smartphones. And that is. Uh, that, that's incredible. So when people talk about you know mobile first and smartphone first, um, that is that's Myanmar. You know any 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 tech startup that is serious about Myanmar is the building for smartphones. Uh, I'll ask a last question here of you guys. How how can people help? How can we all help? Well, <clears throat> we're really lucky um, that um, that uh, Omidia Network. Um, and uh, the Open Society Foundation have provided um, some of the critical seed funding to the Myanmar Innovation Greenhouse to get it up and going, and that's enabled us to get this uh, great space at a great price and to start building a team and start conducting some of the activities. But um, we're definitely looking f for more help, and if any of your listeners, Michael, would, would love to support innovation in Myanmar, um, we have a little place online where people can go. Um, it's www gofundme.com forward slash mi greenhouse so that's uh, gofundme.com forward slash mi greenhouse um, that's one way they could help um, you know another important way is there's obviously enormous amounts of talent um, um, you know here in the states and in other other developed markets and there's a lot of talk about digital leapfrogging mm -hmm. um, but in order to do that you need to avoid reinventing the wheel, uh, to, to mix my metaphors. Um, and to do that, you need to, you need to have an understanding of other things that have worked in other markets or failed in other markets. And so I guess one of the things that we want to do with the Innovation Greenhouse is that we want to create a global network of folks who are interested in innovation in Myanmar who can offer their time or their experiences or their resources in other ways to help make sure that Myanmar has access to the kind of knowledge and experiences necessary to actually perform this digital leapfrog. That's going to be really important. Mo, when you go back, uh, what, what do you hope to see the next time you visit? Uh, next time I visit, I should probably stop by and hope to um, maybe help run a hackathon. Um, so Please. <laughs> Our, our company has been fortunate enough to be profitable, and we've been able to donate money to projects, educational projects in Burma. And that was part of our foundational thesis is when we do make profits, we would. So I'm looking forward to doing something like a education theme hackathon, um, just also just helping out any startup entrepreneurs and startup communities that are out there that wants to start and want a, you know, kind of like a digital bridge to Silicon Valley. I'm trying to get a lot of, you know, Burmese um, nationals in Bay Area who are in the startup scene to figure out how can we be off use in any way from what we have seen, what we have learned, either as startup employees, startup founders. Great. Well, um, Ethan... David and Mo, I want to thank you guys so much uh, for the conversation. Incredibly interesting and, and very exciting as well. Thank you, guys. Thanks thank for you. having us, Michael. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thanks for watching.